Firstly, I'd like to thank Rerun for inviting me um, for this discussion. I was quite shocked to realize that it's actually been 100 Gregorian years since the official abolition of the caliphate system, or the caliph. Uh, in 1922, the Turkish uh, state under Mustafa Kemal uh, detached the Sultaniyah from the caliph. So the caliph didn't have any official authority anymore. He was a figurehead. But that still wasn't good enough for Mustafa Kemal, who didn't want the hassle of having a potential rival to his authority. Uh, and also, he didn't want the, the pressure from foreign governments who were, might be concerned that the caliph was influencing Muslims in their countries. And so he done away with it completely and he abolished the caliph himself. So he was no longer a figurehead. He had no status at all whatsoever. And this is what was, in, a, in about a week's time, would be 100 years ago. Now, many Muslims look throughout history and they say, well, you know, the way people talk about Khilafah, it's like it's some, you know, idealistic utopia. You know, King Arthur and Camelot, if, to, from the English perspective, right? Some mythical realm where, you know, every day was rainbows and no one suffered and it was uh, just, it was Jannah fil Ard. Okay? But no one's ever said that Khilafah is that. No one's ever said that establishing the deen of Islam is going to be without the imperfections inherent in human beings. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the best ruler the Muslims have ever known, had to suffer with munafiqeen in his time, had to suffer from uh, the, even the Sahabas, sometimes almost getting into dispute with each other, talking about old past divisions that, between them. We are, we, the reason why we have examples of the had being applied, where the prohibition of Allah have been breached, for someone drinking alcohol, someone committing fornication, is because people did it during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. People breached these rules, right? People sometimes had bad adab, bad akhlaq during his time. But no one ever says, oh, that was an imperfect time. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad was a, was a billah, bad ruler, or this is why we shouldn't establish it. No, they would never say this. In some ways, this leads us to the problem of why the, the Ummah don't have an Imam and don't have a Khilafah. Now you see, obviously, there's a colleague, fellow colleague who's, who's a revert. I'm also a revert, even though I, I'm kind of I, I'm from Mediterranean background, so people say, oh, well, if you don't have blue eyes and blonde hair, you're not a real revert. <laughs> right? I met someone who used to be Hindu and they converted to, uh, they were Indian, they used to be Hindu, they converted to Islam. People said, eh, you're not really a revert, you're just Pakistani now. <laughs> it's like, even though I would, uh, I would lord and, and respect that person's conversion process more than someone who has it relatively easier in England because from their background, the, the resistance they faced was much worse, but it's a side point. But every revert, whenever they become Muslim and they just read about Islamic history and they see that Muslims had uh, one Imam uniting the Ummah, or at least the very, at the very uh, least in the, the central crux leading the central Jama'ah of the Ummah, the central community of the Ummah, they look at the Muslims today and they see Muslims farthest from this. And not only this, Muslims don't seem to want to implement Islamic law, the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which they would tell you is the most perfect system. They don't want to implement it. And this baffles reverts. Say, like, what? I don't understand. But you, you, you say you're Muslim, you say you believe in this, but you're not implementing this. What's going on? What's happened to the mind of the Muslim that they're not doing this? Now this, this mystery, I've spent 20 years banging my head against the wall trying to, trying to understand why, what's going on there. Uh, funnily enough, my encounter with the concept of Khilafah actually came from a book. Uh, it was written by, uh, funnily enough, a, a, a modernist or a secular reformist, 
type Muslim, quote unquote, Zildin Sardar. Uh, he was like an old school uh, secular reformist. And he was just talking about Muslims, right? His uh, Muslim uh, thought. He goes, Oh, and some Muslims believe in that the Muslims should bring back Khilafah. And I was like, Oh, what's this? Khilafah. And I, and I read it, but I, Oh, that's a very good idea. Why, don't they, why aren't we doing this? Because it seems natural that what is wrong and what actually is unwise about us actually uniting, pooling our resources together, pooling our manpower together, and making the purpose of the state the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine it was the national interest of a state to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How different would that be to what you see in, in the world today? But isn't that what Muslims are meant to be doing anyway? So what went wrong? And so I've spent 20 years trying to work out, in, in a way, what has gone terribly wrong in the Muslim mindset that they're totally okay and happy with the status quo. Well, not happy and okay because we're suffering and mis miserable and, and being reaved left, right and center, massacred, humiliated, banned from all our practices. And yet, the most obvious solution is the one that receives the most obstacles from the Ummah. Like if you want, if you want the, unfortunately it seems, today, it seems today that as soon as you mention Khilafah, the first people to attack you are people who call themselves Muslim. Of course, they can't say that it's not an obligation, of course, because this goes beyond the realm of Islam. <laughs> but they say, okay, what's your obligation and why aren't you implementing it? It's almost like they're trying to deny it without denying it. It's an obligation they're to do everything else except everything but deny it. What's going on? Well, let's, let's first get into some responses, I think, to the misconceptions that Muslims have. Because really, it's misconceptions that Muslims have about their own deen, which is why they don't work for it. And this is wherein lies the solution. As it was mentioned, the Imam is a shield. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that the Imam is a shield behind which the Ummah fight and behind which the Ummah defend itself. Notice the hadith that doesn't have a plural to that, not the, the imma, the, or the, the Imams, but the Imam, singular, is a shield. And people often say, oh, but uh, if it was so perfect and so strong, what have you, how comes that the Ottoman uh, Caliphate collapsed and fell and so on and so forth when it was in World War I? Surely it didn't work there. Well, that's, that's a bad argument because even united, you'd have a better chance than you are divided anyway against any outside aggression. So you're, you're, you're now, like, it's just saying, well, I might have one leg, but you know what, I might as well just, it's better to have two, le two legs cut off than, uh, uh, than one leg cut off. It's like, that's ridiculous. At least be better one leg than no leg. But, but even then, that's not exactly true. During World War I, the Ottomans, despite their economic weakness, despite the decline of the Muslims, actually held off against multiple world powers for a significant proportion of time, beating the British, British armies in many battles where they were outnumbered by the British. Right? For example, the campaign in Iraq. The Ottomans, not only, the, 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 it was, sorry, there was a British army that invaded Iraq. Uh, it, was the, it was called the, the Kut campaign, I suppose. Uh, they had Indian soldiers that, that bolstered the ranks of the army. They came via Afghanistan. What did the Ottomans do? They not only defeated them, they captured the entire British army in Iraq. What about Gallipoli? Gallipoli. Uh, Churchill's idea that they're going to take Constantinople by attacking Turkey directly, the Anatolia where it is, or Tur modern day Turkey directly. Eventually they'll, take, they'll cut the head off the, the opponent as they, as they viewed it. They'd take Constantinople, they launched, it was actually a precursor, the idea was a precursor idea to D-Day. So they would, they would do some landings, massive British forces, and just push the Turks and take Constantinople, eventually failed with mass casualties on the British. Hundreds of thousands of British soldiers dead. The Ottomans beat and defeated and pushed off the British army. There. Ah, you might say, but what about, and currently with the, the town of Gaza, which is being bombarded by, some you could say another creation of the British Empire, Gaza was subject to three attacks by the British army. 
Each one, the British army, were three battles. Each one, the British army outnumbered the Ottomans, about three to one. For the first two battles of Gaza, this is Gaza under attack. You didn't see what, you didn't see what was happening, uh, you didn't see what, the repetition of what you saw, you're seeing happen there, where the Gazans who were unable to defend themselves are just getting bombed and obliterated and massacred. No, the Ottomans, as the shield of the Ummah, pushed back the British twice, defeated the British twice. But what happened with the third one, the third battle, the battle they lost? Well, that was only about a year later, after the British had made a deal with Sharif Hussein in, in Hijaz and the, a, a, a tribe you might have heard of called the Saud, made a deal with those people to be, support the British against the Ottomans. And then these people started to attack the Ottoman army from the rear, attacking their supply lines, uh, pinning them down. The, the Ottomans had to send 100,000 troops just to hold down Arabia against the guerrilla warfare, some would say terrorist campaign, uh, by these tribes, by these factions. And it was only after this weakening of the Ottomans that on the third attempt by the British, then they were successful and they took Gaza and then opened up the way. And even then, the Ottoman army wasn't defeated. They, could, they still had fight in them, right? But Mustafa Kemal, the commander, said, I don't want any more Turkish lives being wasted on, uh, on defending the Muslims uh, in, down there. So he withdrew the armies. Even though the, the Ottoman armies were still, were still there, he, he claimed the Arabs had betrayed the Turks and tried to incite ethnic conflicts between the Muslims, even though Syrian Arabs and Palestinian Arabs were part of the Ottoman army. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not Arabs. So, and, and at the same time as all this happening, the Ottomans fought the Russians coming down the Caucasus. And the Russians had massive armies. Fought them to the point that the Russians asked for a truce, which the Ottomans uh, made. And then when the, so the Russian Revolution happened, they continued fighting, not the Turks, but they, they fought the uh, Persians. The Ottomans didn't really care about the Persians because obviously they were a splinter group from the Muslims. But um, they fought the Russians until there was a truce. They did all this. They fought the Russian Empire, the, the, the British with the French in alliance, all at the same time. And of course, the Arab tribes from the south, all at the same time. All right? And they scored victories and they held back, uh, causing hundreds of thousands of dead in the British army, uh, amongst some of the French some, and the Russians and so on and so forth. That was how powerful they were, the Ottomans, the Uthman Khilafa. We would be lucky to even have uh, the state of Armenia be pushed back by a Muslim country today, a small state. Right? It conquered part of Azerbaijan. Only recently, Azerbaijan took it back with Turkish help. Right? But that was the situation. Uh, we'd be lucky to see that today. So what is the point of all this? The point is that it's quite common sense that the Muslim Ummah is stronger when we are together. Right? People say, uh, and, and this, is, this shows, I think, the misunderstanding that Muslims have of the deen of Islam. They say, if, if the Khilafah is obligatory, where is it mentioned in the Quran? Why is it not mentioned in the Quran? Yeah, okay, it's mentioned in the Sunnah, right? That you, should, uh, you shouldn't have, um, be leaderless, and if there's a Khalifa, you should give bayah, and so on and so forth. But they say, but where does it say explicitly that you must appoint a Khalif? Why does it not say this in the Quran or Sunnah? And I say, well, firstly, I think there's actually, there's a hikmah why it's not, that's not said in the Quran or Sunnah. Because it says everything else. It says you must rule by the hukum of Allah. If in the law of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the good and the bad, what he prohibits, what he declares good, what he declares bad, what he obliges, this is how you must judge your fellow Muslims, how you should resolve disputes, right? And the collective obligations, distributing money, taking care of the poor, prohibiting riba. Uh, interest banking, right? <coughs> Doing the collective defense of the Muslim lands via jihad and so on and so forth, right? These are collective obligations. You can't do them as individuals, 
The Quran also says, do not be divided amongst yourselves. Right? Don't be divided amongst yourselves. What does that mean? That everyone has a, shares the same opinion? That everyone have, have, shares the same beliefs? Follows the same madhab? Is that what it means? What does it mean? Don't be divided. Yeah. Or about that Muslims shouldn't dispute with each other. Lest uh, we... we, we uh, we lose heart and our, we become weak, our strength departs ourselves. We, we go in so much disputes that we basically don't want to f work with each other anymore and our strength departs. The Quran is all about Muslims maintaining strength, uniting their strength together, fi sabirillah. How can you achieve that with anything else except the Khilafah? That's why even the Mutazala, even the Mutazala who argued that one of, the, one of the arguments of the Mutazala was that the, uh, there was a faction of the Mutazala who said that, well, the Khilafah is not a specific obligation, it's just the only way you can satisfy the obligations that the Quran requires you <laughs> to achieve, right? That, that was their way of, of arguing it. But the standard way is, the standard argument is the Ijma of the Sahaba. That on the death of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, they said the Muslims must have an Imam. The Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad was the Imam of the Muslims. He was the Imam of the Jama'ah, the, the, the Muslims who've come together. Right? Now he has passed away, we need a new Imam. We need someone to succeed him. And that's what the word Khilafah means, successorship. The one who succeeds the Prophet Muhammad's place as the Imam of the Muslims. We don't need a successor prophet. We need a successor imam. It is said that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. Yeah. Right? In ilm, in knowledge. But who inherits the prophets? Amr. Authority. It's not the scholars. It's the imam. So we have an incomplete inheritance from the Prophet Muhammad. It's incomplete. For the 100 years, it has been incomplete. And what have we seen over these 100 years? We have seen invasion after invasion after invasion, massacre after massacre. And there's going to be new massacres occurring, uh, some, maybe even worse ones. There are like two, about 200 million Muslims held hostage, in a sense, to the BJP in India. Right? 200 million. Right? So if you think the Holocaust was bad with 6 million, but 200 million. If you think World War II was bad, uh, with the amount of people who died, and that 200 million Muslims are at threat in India, who's going to rescue them? And you might say to yourself, well, you know, it's very bad, it's, it's saddening, but you know, what, what can you do? Well, imagine Modi, the president of, of uh, India, Prime Minister of India, wants to invade Saudi Arabia and destroyed the Kaaba. Imagine he was preparing an Indian army and they were going to invade Arabia and they were going to destroy the Kaaba. What would you do? You say, oh, too bad. Oh, well, you know, bad things happen. All right? I think everyone here would volunteer to, to join the local forces and defend that. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is narrated that to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for him, the blood of a Muslim, the one drop of the blood of the Muslim is worth more to him than the Kaaba and all its surroundings. In Gaza, the Kaaba has been destroyed 30,000 times. No, more than that, because the blood of Muslim that includes the wounded as well. Uh, 100,000 times, because there's 70,000 wounded, let's not forget. 100,000 times the Kaaba has been destroyed, right? No response, no real response from the Muslim leaders, the Muslim world. Why is that? Why do you think that is? You might say, oh, because they're cowardice, because they just, uh, some people say they're secretly manafikin. I'm not gonna comment on that. Do you know why? It's because what is the purpose of Turkey? What is the purpose of Jordan? 
What is the purpose of Egypt? What is the purpose of Pakistan? What is the purpose of Saudi Arabia? We ask that question, what is their purpose? Its purpose is just to look, survive, look after their own affairs. They don't have a purpose. That's why there's no answer to that question. They just exist. What is the purpose of Khilafah? It's the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Caliph Mutasim Billah would care about the honor of a, of a woman because it's the purpose of Khilafah to care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure, to avert his wrath and his anger, to do what pleases him because that is the purpose of life for mankind. So don't be surprised when any of these factions or firaq in the Muslim world don't do anything fi sabilillah because that's not their purpose. These countries have not been given that purpose when they were created by the colonial powers or created after the collapsed Ottoman state. That's not their purpose. And this leads me on to the answer I found why the Muslim ummah doesn't do anything generally, anything real. Yes, they feel agitation about what's happening in Gaza and they feel anger, they feel sadness. Uh, they feel this because there is that sentiment there. But why is there not any real action? Why? Because the purpose of life for most Muslims is not Islam. You might think, what do you mean by this? Because they say they're Muslim, but well, doesn't that mean that your purpose of life? Well, there are Christians who say that they believe in Christianity, but it doesn't mean that Christianity is their purpose of life. Same with Judaism, same with any other religion. Why is this? It's because of how Muslims are taught Islam by their parents, right? You're taught that Islam is part of your life. It's not the purpose of your life. That's how you're taught it. That's how most Muslims are taught it, right? They say the purpose of life, they don't even say it, they just say son or, or daughter, uh, you know, maintain your family honor, get a good reputation in society, maybe get a good job, have, you know, get a life of ease and relaxation. We even wish, we wish it as a dua, may Allah make it easy for you, ease. And then we wonder why Muslims are scared of anything difficult. <laughs> because or why we have wahan, right? Love of life, fear of death. Because we've made our purpose of life just this life. Right? It's, but as a Muslim, but while you're, while you're living this life and trying to uh, get these things in life, uh, just make sure that you pray five times a day, uh, you fast during Ramadan and you testify the Shahada, that's fine. Right? Uh, but everything else, you know, you should follow, uh, follow what society is doing. And what do you think these kids here, right in the front, right? What do you think these kids here, what do you think the kids like them around the Muslim world? Yeah? What do you think they do when they see their parents uh, just, just not doing anything, really, just living, just focusing on, on getting some interest in their life, whatever they think is important in their, in their life, even though in the cosmic, the cosmic scale of things, it's all meaningless. Only Allah's pleasure has any meaning to it, but what do you think it teaches them, their parents teach them when they see their parents who tell them about Islam, who tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who tell them about the Prophet Muhammad what do you think the kids, what do you think the parents are teaching these kids when they see that the parents teach them, how, here's how you pray to, now that's it, now rest of life, here's what I expect you to do in, in the rest of your life, you know, job, marriage, blah, 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 normal stuff. I mean, not saying these things are wrong, but these, that is the end of all things. That is your end, there's nothing beyond that, right? What do you think the, 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 the kids will think? See, the kids will say that, well, it's, the reason I'm Muslim is because my parents told me that this is what the, the, the haq is, the truth is, 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 is Islam. But if their Islam comes from their parents, then don't be surprised when they go no further than what their parents did. If they don't see their parents doing anything, then they're not going to do anything. They think it is acceptable just to focus on your own life and the worldly interests, as they say, right? Whereas a Sahabi, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when they encountered the Deen of Islam and they embraced it, they realized something that Muslims, many Muslims, they don't realize. They realized that apart from the pleasure of Allah, everything else is meaningless. Those stone statues are meaningless. 
or the wooden ones, or Qurayshi culture, or the, or the culture of the Arabs that people used to praise and so on and so forth, uh, or burying your daughters alive because it was a shame. This is all meaningless, empty, and even evil, actually. Right? They realize that, that, that there is no purpose in life except Allah's pleasure. Everything else, family honor, national pride, meaningless, has no weight on the Day of Judgment, completely empty. If you fight and die for national pride, you're, you've lived a meaningless life and you've died for nothing. That's why the Prophet Muhammad said that those who, who call for, fight for, die and die for asabiyya, like nationalism, tribalism, or grouping together, or any kind of group other than the, the ummah of believers, then they have died the death of jahaliya, the death of ignorance before Islam. But also, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that if uh, you die without a bayah on your neck, right, a pledge of allegiance to the Imam, basically, not to anyone else, not to, any, not to your, your, lo your local peer, right? <laughs> local must mystic or what have you, no, a pledge of allegiance on your neck, you, you die a death of jahaliya. Because you can only manifest Islam in its totality with an imam with a khalif. And you say, why is that? Why is that? It's because you might pray and you might fast and that's great. But do you know what you spend most of your day doing? You spend most of your day interacting with other human beings in society, work, neighbors, society. That's what you spend most of your day. Unless you're doing ihtiqaf every day for the rest of your life, you're just isolated in a mass, just praying all day. If you, unless that's you, most of the time you're spending interacting with other human, other human beings, your fellow Muslims. And in that area, if Islam is not implemented, then most of your life, Islam has no relevance to. That's why many youth, when they grow up in the Muslim world, they see that Islam, yeah, it's religion, but they don't see any relevance to their life because Muslims have made Islam irrelevant. Yes, secularism was taught to them and they, they made it irrelevant because they took this belief but basically, that's the bottom line of what, what it is. They think it is irrelevant. So if you want to, if you want to bring back Khilafah, bring, bring back the shield of the Ummah, a, 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 combine our resources, combine our power, combine our might. If you want to do this, then it starts. Each and every one of you must take personal responsibility to revive the Ummah by reminding Muslims, and in many cases, actually just teaching Muslims, that Islam is their purpose of life, not just a part of their life. Ask them, why are you Muslim? If they say, my parents made me so, then how are they any different to the, the, the Jahal Arabs who said, I follow my religion because my parents told me, right? They have to have yaqeen, they have to have knowledge why they're Muslim. From their own thinking, the Quran tells you to think. The Quran expects you personally to ask questions and think and come to the conclusion yourself via observing Allah's ayat, his signs. Muslims need to have that as a foundation, because when they have that as a foundation, when this foundational, why they become a Muslim is not society, but it is reality itself, then they will no longer be slaves to a jahil society, and they will be revived. That's one point. Second point is that, and this concerns the method now, is that, well, how do we change Muslim societies? Okay, one of the, one point is we need to remind Muslims why they're, well, remind, i.e. teach Muslims from the foundation first, why they're Muslim in the first place. Why are you Muslim? What is Islam? Right. How it deals with every, every aspect of life. How it can solve economic problems. How can you have an economic system that doesn't rely on interest banking? Right. And this needs to be solved, do you know why? Because if you don't solve that problem, then what Muslims will think is, well, interest banking is now a durura, it's necessary, because there's no other way I can imagine. And therefore, if it's necessary, it becomes halal, halal stamp. Get to your local uh, sheikh, because today, muftis today, their main job, not all, but many of their muftis, the main job of muftis is just to rubber stamp halal. It's the halal. That's a different discussion, but I'll, uh, I, will, um, I will simply emphasize that for example, shallow thinking means that they will read hadith and get it completely wrong. They read hadith about you must obey the ruler and think, okay, but it must apply to any ruler, all rulers, right? 
So if, if, it's like it's the equivalent, it's the, it's the equivalent absurdity of a Muslim reading about how you should treat women and uh, you know and, and look after them and maintain being maintained as women and say, okay, well then, you know, my, my local prostitute, I should help maintain her and look after her because she's a woman, right? Yeah. You know, like, you know, it's, this is a, like a zawaj, right? Like, no, it's not like marriage. Yeah? And in a way, that's a great analogy for the modern rulers compared to what Islam considers to be the rulers. Right? What is, what is, we've seen many ahadith by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, obey your leader even if he is, because the Arabs were racist, even if he was an Ethiopian. He was not an Arab, like, basically like you. In essence, that's, that's, that's the intended meaning. Um, as long as he... Aqama Kitab Allah establishes the Book of Allah amongst you. Always there was that as a condition. They're only a ruler as long as they rule by Islam. And then they say, oh, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not a condition, they don't have to do it, you know, as long as they, they rule, you just have to obey them. And I say, no, because why do we have rulers in the first place? What's the point of rulers? It's to establish laws, right? Maintain order and so on. Laws according to what? Allah's hukum. Allah's law. Right? In, the, in classical scholarship, they do takfir of any ruler that actually implements anything other than the, the, the hukum of Allah. Why is that? Because when you make a law, when you make a law, you're saying, this is permissible. This is prohibited, right? Well, the Muslim Ummah today, their shallow thinking and their lack of understanding is so bad that they don't get it. They think, no, 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 it's only if the ruler says this is halal haram according to Islam. But if they say it's halal haram according to them, it's okay. That's not, that's not contradict, that's, it's wrong, it's bad, but it's not uh, kufr. They say, no, but it is because where on, this pla where on planet Earth or in the whole universe is there a separate space for you to declare a separate uh, a system of halal haram or what is permissible and what is prohibited, what is legal or what is illegal, okay? So shallow thinking of Muslim Ummah has to be challenged. And lastly, as term the method, as Ibn Khaldun defined for us the method to revive the Muslim Ummah. That revival must come with organized groups of Muslims who work in a coordinated manner to change society. Why is that? Why can't it be as individuals? Right? It can't be. Why? Well, Ibn Khaldun discusses that an individual can be taken out and, and that's the end of their movement, but um, he mentions that hadith saying that no messenger was sent that did not enjoy the protection of his people, had people around him, basically, right? So what Ibn Khadul mentions. But in essence, society, every society has a social contract. It's an agreement between everyone. You call it culture. Maybe it's called culture, right? Although the Sahabas would call it a deen, because there's no such thing as deen and culture, it's just deen. Right? Whatever, whatever you're following, whatever you think is good and bad amongst the people, that's your deen. Right? The question is, is it deen of Islam or not? So everyone has a, there's a social contract, everyone has a certain set of expectations from each other. You might not even agree with your culture, but you still have to follow it in, in, in public practice because you understand that that's expected from you and you're expected from them. Now here's the thing, you could have a society of only 100 people, let's say, and they all believe that Islam is the, is, uh, is the only basis for the, hukum, uh, for the hukums, for good and bad and what have you, but if they don't know what each other thinks about it, they can, be, they can follow something that's against Islam. Their culture could be non-Islamic, right? If you, if you saw that, the only way to change that is someone comes in and goes, hey guys, 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 everyone, come, come, come in. Uh, do you all believe that only Allah SWT can make hukum? Yes. Do you all believe that only him, he is the basis for good and bad? Yes. Okay. Well then, let's all implement the deen of Islam. And here's what, it, here's what it does. And everyone, if they say, I agree, I agree, and they look at each other, oh, you're agreeing, and you're agreeing, oh, okay. Suddenly there's a change. That the social contract has changed. Because you've seen everybody else acknowledging at this change. This is what we call political campaigning. It's why you have campaigning in the first place. You can't just go to, I can go to 100 individuals and tell you and convince you, I can go to, I can go to 7 million individuals and convince them about, to change their mind about something. I can go to everyone in Pakistan and to say, we must have hukum of Allah, the basis of the state. And everyone will personally agree with me, but in public, they will still continue doing the same thing. Unless 
People see a group of people going out in public and telling, guys, everyone, it's time to change society to a new social contract, a new, well, an old <laughs> dean, right? And when people see this public, oh, okay, then it's safe for me now to, to follow that. And I can, and we, we can, you've now changed the social expectation. That's why you need to have political movements. You can't do it as individuals, right? And I think, and lastly, while doing this, while educating the Ummah, while raising their level of thinking, making them understand why they're Muslim, why, what's their purpose of life, uh, building multiple groups, because it doesn't have to be one group, it can be multiple groups, they're all working to re-establish the deen of Islam in the Muslim world, also simultaneously doing the same kind of da'wah to those people who are power brokers in, in a state. The Ahl Halul Aqt, as the classical scholars called them, those who are the kingmakers. Because behind every dictator, there's a little group of generals and commanders that have, are influential, and these dictators need their support to still to be dictators, basically. That's why um, uh, Hosni Mubarak, he was removed from power, and there was no, there was no uh, fighting or whatever, because his, his power broker said, oh, this guy is not a good figurehead for us anymore, change him, right? Or why, you know, some might say a certain um, Pakistani politician got sent to jail because the power brokers in uh, a certain set of power brokers in Pakistan uh, realized or thought that, he, that uh, you know, he was, he'd be a liability in relation to their international commitments or support from other people internationally, uh, from other for, for foreign powers. So you need to do this dawah to these, these power brokers or those underneath those power brokers because it's like a pyramid, you know because they are not foreigners. They have family from amongst you. You probably have, are probably connected one or two, at least an attachment of one or two uh, divisions between you and one of these power brokers, guaranteed. You might, one of your chachas might know this, might be best friends with, with them, your uncles or what have you, right? These people, are, these power brokers, they are the product of the same society every other Muslim is, right? They think Islam is part of their life, not the purpose of their life. That's why, for their perspective, they're acting totally rationally, which is, yeah, you know, uh, let's not let these Islamic movements get into power because they are, to, to make Islam the purpose of the state and not just part of the state is extremism. Because how I was taught Islam was that Islam is part of your life, not your purpose in life. That's why they call it extremism, right? Even though anyone opens up any history book or any classical scholar's text, and they, they would say that Islam is the only purpose of life. Right? So this is what we need to do collectively. Uh, and I, I will I'll finish up with the absolute last point, which is I had a, 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 a potential uh, idea I wanted to offer. And it was an idea I got from seeing uh, the, the, the success of, unfortunately, the, how the Zionists were able to take Palestine. A hundred years ago, since it's about 100, it's about, the theme is 100 years today. Well, more than 100 years ago. Uh, Zionists or, or people, Jews that were living in different parts of the world were deeply divided and bickering and arguing over how to save Jews from persecution in U Europe. Some said, just assimilate, become like Europeans 100%, they'll accept you. Others said, you don't have to assimilate, but just go to, to countries where you can basically be respected. All one said, no, we have to find a country maybe and make a, a, a state for Jews, by Jews. It could be anywhere in the world because they didn't really care where, where Argentina, even part of America, there was, there was, there was so much ikhtilaf. Others said, no, 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 don't set up a state for Jews because we have to wait for the Messiah to come. We have to wait for the Mahdi to come. I mean, sorry, sorry, not the Mahdi. <coughs> the Messiah to come. Why does that sound familiar? Um, we have to wait for the Messiah to come to establish the state, right? And so there was this division amongst them. So they couldn't set up one group and say, everyone join this one group because there was so much fractional infighting. So they came up, so Theodor Herzl, you could say, he's not the, the inventor of Zionism, but he was the guy who, who drove it forward. He had this great idea, which is, let's set up a talking shop, a place where you just get multiple groups to come, and let's just talk to each other about how, about finding a solution to saving Jews from persecution around the world and setting up a state. And this was called the Zionist Congress. Now it's called the World Zionist Congress, but it's called the Zionist Congress, 
right? And through that talking shop, despite the fact there was different factions and different movements, they started to begin working together. If someone had an opportunity lo locally, they could say, well, hey guys, I've got this opportunity. Would you like to give, me, give some resources or help me with this? And that's what happened. I think, this is my humble suggestion, is you can feel free to accept or reject, but I think as Muslims, we should set up uh, a, a worldwide, united, in a sense, Congress, where we, we get multiple Islamic groups, movements, anyone who cares about the deen of Islam, who wants to see the Khilafah reestablished, just to begin talking to each other, as well as new movements and new groups, if need be, right? As long as you're guided by knowledge and understanding, uh, to talk to each other and see how we can uh, advance the cause of reestablishing Islam. And I put it as a responsibility, well, not just me, but, well, it's not me putting a responsibility. Allah's, Allah's going to ask you this, so it's Allah's, Allah's responsibility for you, on you, every individual, to take it as your personal responsibility to revive the deen of Islam. Right? Why do you think me and many of these du'at and others you've seen, how do you think that we uh, were able to get involved in, in da'wah and to, to achieve whatever, whatever, well, whatever meager things I've achieved, but how do you think we got this? The, our mentality was simply take personal responsibility. Don't let someone else do it. Do it yourself. If you don't do it, no one else can. The next person can have the same idea you. Well, I'll let someone else do it. I'll let someone else do it. Let someone, and then, if everyone thought that like that, nothing would happen. Take personal responsibility. Who knows? You could be the key to reviving the deen of Islam, right? Fidel Herzl wasn't, wasn't able to, it wasn't Fidel Herzl himself who managed to get the British to agree, the Balfour Declaration to agree to give them Palestine. It was a contact of his. Okay, the Rothschilds, but um, they, the, there was their influence, he got, he got food to them and their contact with the British managed to make that deal happen. So who knows, whichever one of you could be the new Musab bin Omer. Right? Musab bin Omer, he goes to Yathrib. It wasn't the Prophet that went to Yathrib at that time, it was Musab bin Omer. And he, as an individual Muslim, with those who had initially embraced Islam amongst the, the Aus and Hazraj, went and gave da'wah to the, the people of Yathrib. He didn't convert all of them, but his da'wah for one year just one year of his da'wah, not, it wasn't a prophet doing it. SubhanAllah, I think there's hikman in this. In showing, because if a prophet did it, you, you, you Muslim today, we'd all say, we would, uh, we have to wait for a prophet. Only a prophet can re reestablish Islam. No, Musa bin Omer. He goes to Yathrib, gives da'wah to the point that society is ready to accept the deen of Islam, or even to accept it in their affairs. And that was sufficient. So, barakallahu feekum, and if, you, if the take home message is this, be the next Musab bin Omer. Barakallahu feekum.